Today's talk is entitled Top Tips for Speaking and Presenting in the Virtual World. Please welcome Dave Henson. Thank you very much, Evelyn. And he hello, everybody. And, th and thanks for um, inviting me to uh, to speak at the summit. Can I just check? I, mean, I was going to say, can I check by show of hands? But everyone's turned their camera off for some reason. Um, but I assume you can all see my slides. If you can't see my slides, then we'll, someone, yes, oh, there's thumbs up going up everywhere, which is brilliant. Thank you very much. And camera's going on as well, which is what I like to see. Okay, so as um, as Evelyn said, my presentation is entitled Top Tips for Speaking and Presenting in a Virtual World. And I'm going to break down the presentation into two parts. First bit is going to be basically about presenting virtually, speaking and presenting virtually, whether you're using slides or whether you're not. So as you can see from my logo, I'm known as the slide presentation man. And the second part of the presentation is going to be about using slides. And this is whether you're presenting virtually or in the room. And there's going to be a nice little bit of segue in the middle about my kind of rules for using slides when you're presenting online. So let's kick off with a bit about your, your technical setup when you're presenting uh, online. So the first thing is about using a, a green screen. I'll put down there, use a green screen, but it should say use a green screen if dot, dot, dot. Because um, if you've got a great background, if you've got a nice bookcase in the background or a lovely view, you know, then that's great. That's no problem at all. Um, so I have a I have a green screen set up, which is basically a green roll of line, which is in my studio. I can just winch the screen down and winch it back up again when I'm not using it. And the back, the screen you can see behind me now is the virtual background, which we'll, uh, we'll come on to in a short while. Second thing is to make sure that, you, you, that you're well lit, light your face. Now I've got two lights. I've got a, if, you, if I look up, you can see it reflected in my glasses. I've got the, uh, the square LED light just above my main monitor. And on the right hand side, I've got a, a round ring light. Um, you only need one light. The reason I use two is because I've got my square LED light set up and fixed in place. Um, and then I realized that the, the color of the light was quite uh, was quite white um, and it made me look a little bit pale. So the ring light has got a nice warm feel to it um, and it gives me a little bit of a suntan. So this, the reason I've got two lights is just purely down to vanity. That's all. It's just down to vanity. <laughs> but one light should be fine. And the ring light, by the way, the one I've got here um, costs, in fact, I'll show you a picture of it and what might help, mind it? Um, the ring light costs about, uh, I think about cost about £20 on, on wish.com. So uh, it's not expensive at all. And, and the ring light on its own would do a perfectly adequate job. Next most important thing, or one of the most important things, is to use a good quality microphone. Now, I use the Rode NT USB microphone. It's, uh, I think it costs about £130. So it's not particularly cheap, but it really does help uh, enhance the quality of your voice. And as we know, as Toastmasters, our voice is very important, but online it becomes even more important. Use a decent webcam. I use the uh, Logitech c922 hd pro uh, which is as the, as the name implies is, is a high definition web camera um it, it, show, it shows up all my all my wrinkles someone did point out to me that on zoom you've got this little button that you can use to uh touch up your appearance and someone when i pointed out you can see wrinkles and spots on my face i said you should turn that on and i said i've already got it turned on and it's put up right to the full amount as well <laughs> so, um but yeah so a decent webcam and another important thing that um, you can do to really enhance your online presentations is to use a wired internet connection rather than wireless or other than Wi-Fi. I don't know whether you've seen, if you use Wi-Fi, you may have seen the message come up on the screen that says your internet connection is unstable. Um, I used to get that on and off when I was presenting using Wi-Fi and I've now plugged my internet into, into a wired connection and I haven't seen that since it's been my connection has been perfect it dropped out once um completely dropped out once in a meeting um, but other than that it's been perfect and i'm going to touch wood at this stage and hope that it carries on being perfect for the next hour or so and then as i said it may be use a virtual background now if you've got a, a nice colored screen behind you you don't have to use a virtual background but i i do use virtual backgrounds so let me just talk about virtual backgrounds for a second the reason i use a virtual background is because if i don't put my green screen down then you will see my fridge and my kettle and my office door and the roller blind and everything else behind me 
and it doesn't look very professional. So the first thing I've did is obviously got my green screen, which I which I winched down. I could just use the green screen behind me. The, the green perfectly good just to use the, the green screen. It's clean. It's professional. You can use virtual backgrounds on Zoom without using a green screen. So um, you can do that. But the problem is that if you haven't got a flat color behind you or you're not well lit, then you could get distracting noise on your slides or bits of you being inexplicably cut off or even weird effects like this that you can see on the screen now. I'm sure you've all seen these kind of effects when people are presenting online trying to use a virtual background. Um, and of course, the other important thing is not to wear the same color clothes as your virtual background. So don't wear a green top if, if you're using a green background. So I use virtual backgrounds all the time because, as I say, I need the green screen in front, uh, in, behind me anyway, because I don't want people seeing my fridge and my kettle. And I have my professional backgrounds like this one. I have uh, a coffee shop called the Zoofy Zone, Zo the Zoom coffee shop, which I which I invented. So if anyone ever fancies a coffee with me, you can come along to the to the Zoofy Zone and have a cup of coffee. And of course, at the end of the day, you can go to the virtual pub and have a have a drink. Um, this pub looks a little bit empty, so it's, it's it's very well socially distanced. So what about some tips for presenting online? So that, 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 that first bit covered your tech setup. The second bit is going to cover tips for presenting online. So the first thing is to use a quiet room. Now, I was in a Toastmasters meeting a few months ago where someone was presenting. I don't know why. Don't ask me why. They were presenting from their bathroom. They weren't in the bath, by the way, they, but they were in the bathroom. I don't know whether it's because it was the closest room to the router or something, but they were in a bathroom. And all you could hear was this echo, which was, a, which was a little bit distracting. Also, think about the two thirds rule. The two thirds rule means that your eyes are two thirds of the way up the screen, one third from the top, in other words. And then you can see your, your head and your shoulders in the, uh, in the little 16 by 9 video screen that you, that you're, uh, that you are currently confined to look into the camera. So I'm trying to look into the camera. So you guys think I'm looking into your eyes, of course, because well, the camera effectively is the audience's eyes. Um, and the way that I've done this is I mean, I know you've all got your, your videos turned off today. Um, normally, you, you go into a zoom meeting, people have their videos turned on. And it can be quite distracting, can't you? you're looking down at people on the screen, and you're and you're seeing them moving about. Um, but what I do is I move my audience onto my right hand screen, I've got, a, I've got three screens here. Um, and you are all off on the right hand screen. So if you had your videos turned on, even though there's movement, I'm not going to be distracted by it. I've got my presenter view here on the on the screen. Make sure you put your name right on your zoom uh, tile. Um, at the beginning of lockdown, I noticed there were a lot of people whose surname was iPad, for some reason, John's iPad, Caroline's iPad, and so on. Uh, put your name on there, make sure you spell it right. And everyone knows who you are. Now, here's the thing, isn't it? When when we when we start off with Toastmasters, we're normally told you can do your first couple of speeches without notes, and then you should try to do them without notes, which is great on stage. You should try to, or you should endeavor to do your talks without notes. When you're online, you can use notes. So so don't think of being online as being as being the same as being on stage. Um, I have got, as I say, my presenter view here in front of me. So I've got my my current slide right in front of me, my next slide on the right hand side. And I've got notes on the if I need them on the bottom right. So I need to look down at my notes, I can subtly look down at the notes and, uh, and read them. So don't be afraid to use notes or uh, it don't have to be a whole speech, of course, but it can just be little little hints little. Um, yes, little hints, I can't think of the other word I'm trying to think of now. But you can use notes on online. As I've already said, use your voice. We haven't got body language much anymore now because we can only see from about here upwards. You can use your hands, of course, uh, you can use your eyes, but you've got to use your voice, which is why I say, try to get hold of a good microphone to enhance your your vocal, your vocals. And finally, when you're presenting, stand up, or sit down. Now, there's been a bit of a debate about this in speaking circles, whether you should stand up or sit down when you're presenting. People say, if you stand up, it, you get more energy. Um, I personally prefer to, to speak sitting down. I don't feel that it affects my energy levels that much at all. When we first started presenting online at our Toastmasters group in Bromley, people would stand up and they'd move right back to their to their screen or to their wall. And 
present as though they were on stage. I think this has been a great opportunity to learn how to present within this little 16 by nine window that we are confined to. So um, if, you're, if you're comfortable standing up, that's fine. Make sure that you're not too far away from your, your microphone though. If you can use a clip on microphone when you're standing up, then, then great. But bear in mind also, if people are looking at you in gallery view and your head is um, gonna be quite small anyway, um, if you're standing up, it's going to be tiny, so they're hardly going to be able to see your face, and they're not going to be able to see your, your, your see your your eyes and your expressions. So here's the uh, here's the segue bit. I'm going to talk about using slides online. Now, using slides online, there are a few rules or not rules guidelines that I would that I would suggest, but mostly. The same guides, same rules apply whether you're presenting online or uh, offline, online or on the stage. So the first thing is this. Now, this is something I would normally do at the beginning of my presentation, but I'm going to do it now. <clears throat> Don't be afraid to ask your audience to view you in the way you want them to view you. Now, they may take their notice of you. May, I mean, I can ask you now. What, what I'd like you to do is to make sure that you're viewing me in side-by-side -side mode with my slides on the left and me on the right and then drag that middle drag that bar that's in between us to make me a little bit bigger so that I'm not this tiny little thumbnail at the top right so that you can engage with me more as the speaker that's what I'd like you to do you may turn around and say oh, I'm not going to do that I'm just going to look at it in gallery view and, and, and be happy with it which is fine but don't be afraid at the beginning of your talk to ask your audience to view you the way that you want them to view you um, so so side by side view side by side speaker view it's called because you can do side by side gallery view where the right hand side has got the gallery view where, where you can see everybody <clears throat> i would suggest when using slides online is you close all your other apps and windows which is what i've done today two reasons firstly they can take up memory and if you're using a slide presentation with lots of animation or video it might affect that um, and secondly of course uh, other applications have a, a nasty habit of popping up notifications and beeps right in the middle of your presentation and you suddenly get uh, a very inappropriate WhatsApp message appear on your screen, which everyone, the whole audience can see. So close all other apps and windows to uh, to make it better for your for your audience and for you. Don't overuse animations. Now, this is a, again, this is something that applies on the stage as well as online anyway, but um, Overusing animations, first of all, there may be an issue. By the way, when you when you share your screen to show your slide, there's a, there is a little button or a little checkbox that says um, it says something about enhancing your video so that animations show better. I can't remember exactly what the words are now, but there are two little checkboxes that uh, um, allow you to make sure your animations work properly. But don't overuse them. And again, following on from that, keep the slides simple. K I S S stands for keep it simple stupid which i don't like very much i think it should be keep it sweet and simple or keep it short and simple and again i mean i always talk about keeping your slides simple anyway even when you're on stage but it's even more important of course when you're online there may be people out there who are looking at your slides on a mobile phone so therefore the simpler they are and obviously the bigger the elements on your slides the better for the audience Make sure you start PowerPoint in slideshow mode. You'll see that I did that. I had my slideshow ready to go so that when I shared my screen, you immediately saw my slideshow rather than seeing the PowerPoint workspace window with the thumbnails down the, re down the left and the menus at the top. So make sure you've got your PowerPoint in slideshow ready to go before you share your screen. And finally, as I've already mentioned, use two screens if possible. And the, and the reason for that, as I said, is because you can put your presenter view on one screen um, and on my left hand screen my left hand screen is what you guys are seeing you're seeing that I'm sharing my left hand screen so that the slideshow in full is on my left hand screen my presenter view is on my middle screen the chat box is on my right hand screen I can see there's already oh, a couple of chats coming through which I'll look at at the end there will be a QA, and a by the way at the end of the presentations I did forget to mention that at the beginning and as I say, the audience is also on my right hand screen. So I've got three screens. There was a guy, the guy that ran the um, the D91 conference in May, whose name escapes me for the time being, he actually was using 11 screens, which I think is, you know, rather greedy, really. I've only got three. But if you can use two screens, it does make your life easier when you're presenting when using slides in uh, in Zoom. 
So before I go on to talk about uh, slides in general, I have a couple of goodies. I've got a couple of PDF files that I'm happy to send out to anyone who wants them. Uh, one is called Top 10 Tips for Slide Presentations that will wow your audience. And the other one covers the online tips, the using slides online and my online presentation tips. If you're interested in them and you're on LinkedIn, do connect with me on LinkedIn and just put in there that you'd like to get a copy of the PDFs or send me an email to dave at the slide presentation man dot co dot uk. And whilst I'm on the subject about uh, the slide presentation man, um, <clears throat> I also have a book called Your Slides Suck, which you can uh, take a look at on my website at the slide presentation man dot co dot uk slash book. I, uh, I run workshops, either public or open workshops or workshops within companies. More information at the slide presentation man dot co dot uk slash workshop. Um, and I also design and produce presentations for my customers. Um, more often than not, what happens is they will send me a presentation that they've already done, knowing that it needs improvement. This is a slide you're seeing coming up on the screen now that I did for the UK Power Networks, um, just describing how it's better to charge your smart car during the uh, off-peak hours rather than during the evening peak. And finally, I have a Facebook page called, funnily enough, Slide Presentation Man. And on there is a character called Bad Dave, who has very different ideas to me about presenting with slides. And there's 26 videos on there, an A to Z of Bad Dave's, Bad Dave's top tips for slide presentations. So moving on. So I'm going to talk now about slides in general, about presenting with slides in general. This applies whether you are presenting online, virtually, or whether you are presenting on the stage, when we're all hoping to get back to doing that as soon as possible, I'm sure you <laughs> agree with me on that one. So I'm going to start by talking about a sample of rice. And you're probably wondering, what the heck has a sample of rice got to do with presenting slides? <clears throat> okay, well, you may have guessed that the sample and rice are both acronyms. And sample, well, sample is represents the list of questions that you should ask and that I always ask before starting a presentation, whether it's, whether you're using slides or not, by the way. So the first thing is, obviously, you need to know your subject. We, most of us know what we're going to talk about, don't we? But you need to know your subject, obviously. The second thing is you need to know your audience. Now, this can make a big difference to how you present. For example, if you're um, someone who talks about getting back to health, your message is going to be very different if you're talking to uh, women who want to get back to fitness after giving birth, as opposed to 70 plus year old men who've had a hip replacement and want to get back to health after their hip replacement. So you need to know who your audience is, you need to know who they are, what, uh, what kind of mixture they are, what their pain points are, what problem you're trying to solve for them. And then, of course, you need to know your message. What message do you want to get across to that audience whilst you're speaking? It may be more than one message. People always say, oh, you have to have only one message. But that's actually not true. If you've got, um, you may have to ha may have one overriding message. But I mean, we all know this from Toastmasters. You've got to try and get a message across. You want to change the, the way people think or what they do or what they feel. And the message is what does that. And then the P and the L are, are slightly more prosaic. P stands for place. Where are you presenting? Are you presenting around a boardroom table? Are you presenting in a large conference room to 500 people? Or are you presenting, as we all are at the moment, online to an audience? And finally, length. Is it a five to seven minute Toastmasters speech? Is it a 15 minute talk, a half an hour talk, 45 minutes to an hour like this one today? Um, and obviously, the length can dictate on how you present your slides or your, sorry, your talk. And then the E stands for execution. So how are you now going to execute your talk based on the answers to those first five questions? And it may be at this point that you decide whether or not you're going to use slides in your presentation. But Rice takes it down to a more granular level, if you'll pardon the pun, because Rice determines when you should and when you shouldn't use slides in your presentation. And it stands for reinforce, illustrate, clarify, and explain. So what I mean by this, if you've got a point in your presentation that needs to be reinforced or illustrated or clarified or explained by the use of a graphic or a visual, then it's a good candidate for firing up your laptop, firing up PowerPoint and producing the slide. So let me give you some examples of what I mean by those four points. If I was to tell you that 
and name Dolly, you'd be able to come in with a, a mute musician and, you know. I think someone needs to be muted. Okay, thank you. If I was to tell you that 47,000 dogs were abandoned in the UK in the past 12 months, I'm sure you'd feel really sad. But if I was to tell you that 47,000 dogs were abandoned in the UK in the past 12 months with that slide on the screen, well, that slide, it reinforces my message. You've got this dog with his doleful eyes staring out as his owner deserts him. By, by the way, no dogs were harmed in the making of this presentation. So that's an example of reinforcement. That reinforces the point that I'm making. What about illustration? Well, if I was to talk to you about the quality of the gold braid in the curtains behind Henry VIII in Hans Holbein's famous portrait, what are you thinking? You're thinking, Dave, show us a picture. Show us what you're talking about. So now I can talk to you about the quality of the gold braid. Look at the quality of the gold braid in the curtains behind Henry VIII in Hans Holbein's famous portrait. Look at the quality of that brushwork. And it illustrates the point that I'm trying to make. Clarification. Well, here is Earth and Jupiter. Let's shrink and enlarge them to their relative sizes. And you can see that the Earth fits into Jupiter's great red spot three times over. So that clarifies that point. You could also say that it's an illustration of that point. So there are crossovers between these, these points. And finally, explanation. Here's a, a simple explanation of the electricity generation process. The wind turbine generates the electricity, then it goes through a step-up transformer and then across the, the grid as the third stage. And then once it comes off of the grid, it goes into a step-down transformer and then the electricity is made available to your home. So that's a very simple diagram to explain a, a process, but it's, a, it's an explanation and it helps get my point across as a slide. But here's the point. If you've got a point in your presentation that doesn't need to be reinforced or illustrated or clarified or explained by the use of a visual, then don't be afraid to go blank. Not you, of course, your slides. So if you're on stage, just put a, a black slide up so that the audience just focuses on you. If you're online, then you can put a black slide up like I've done here now. But if you're going to be not showing slides for a period of time, then just stop sharing your screen so that you then become large on the screen and the audience can focus on you telling your story or whatever it is that you're doing without the slides getting in the way or being a distraction. Let's talk about images for a little while. Why use images in your slide presentations? Well, the first and most obvious reason and a great reason from my point of view is that it means there's less room for text. So anything that cuts down the amount of text on your slide is always a good thing with me. It's more fun though. It's more fun for you as the presenter to create a presentation using images. And it's more fun for the audience to, to see images on the slides rather than lines and lines of text. But the most important thing, of course, is that it makes your slide presentation and your talk more memorable and therefore more effective. However, there are a few things that you should avoid when using images. So let's go through the things I think you should avoid first of all. The first thing you should avoid when using images is using cliches. So this kind of thing here, we've hit our target. I know, let's put a dartboard on the slide with a with an arrow or a dart in the middle of the, uh, of, of, of the target. We've increased our sales with a little swooshing bar chart. And of course, the ubiquitous handshake. If you can't think of anything else to put on a slide, just stick a handshake on, on a business slide. But even worse than that, I think, are these kind of corporate stock images, this kind of men with their suits on around a boardroom table with their smiling, bright white teeth. Um, it's just the thinking behind this kind of image is that the person's thinking, well, I'm, I'm in business. I'm presenting to people who are in business about my business. Therefore, I'll put a picture of people in business on the slide. Now, to me, this is a kind of it's a kind of lazy way of presenting, and it's to me, it's the visual equivalent of using bullet points, and uh, and I would suggest you avoid it at all costs. So, cliche. So, the second thing I think you should avoid is using clip art. Now, I don't mean good quality cartoons, but I mean you know this kind of clip art, which may have just about been acceptable in the 1980s, um, if you were alive in the 1980s. Um, but really, in the 21st century, it should be avoided. And these ubiquitous 3D stickmen, which I dislike a lot, they seem to pop up everywhere on slide presentations. 
The third thing you should avoid is using low resolution images. Now, actually, it's quite hard to find low resolution images these days. Um, but if you do use a low resolution image like this one, it really does not come across very well or very professionally on your uh, presentation. And you can see that one's got a, a, a watermark on it as well, which brings me nicely onto my fourth point, things you should avoid. And that is uh, theft copyright theft. So if I do a search on public speaking in Google Images, these are the results that come up. And I could quite easily lift any one of those slides off and put it onto my presentation. Easy, no problem at all. But it's it's the equivalent of going into uh, Sainsbury's and um, half inch in a packet of digestive biscuits. You could get away with it, but it's obviously not the right thing to do. All of these images, the copyright in these images belongs to someone. And the reason there's no excuse for doing it is because there are so many sources of free or very cheap images nowadays on the web. The two websites or the two stock websites that I use for free images are Pixabay and Unsplash. They're all free images. And then Shutterstock is not free, but it's very cheap. It comes in at about four or five pound an image. Um, and obviously in my line of business, I can I can charge on those costs to, to my customer. But even four and five pounds, if you really want to find a really good image, um, then the Shutterstock has got 300 million plus images. So you should be able to find what you want. Now, Creative Commons, Creative Commons is an image license. It allows you to use images either with a condition attached, like you have to put the attribution, the name of the photographer on it, or completely free of charge. So effectively, the images that are on Pixabay and Unsplash, which are free, are being made available under the Creative Commons free to use license. And the interesting thing about Creative Commons also is that there's a lot of images that are now in the public domain. And the copyright rules in the UK state that once the author has been dead for more than 70 years, the work of art goes into the public domain. So that image I used earlier on of Henry VIII, um, Hans Holbein obviously died more than 70 years ago. So that image is now in the public domain and can be used freely on in your presentations. And if in doubt, take the picture yourself. If you take the picture yourself, you own the copyright and you can use the image wherever you want. This is one that I took. You can see it was taken a long time ago. If you know London, you'll know that uh, the Shard would now be in that picture um, over on the right-hand side where you can see Guy's Hospital. Um, so this was taken from in about 2003, I think, but it was such a lovely sunset from the hotel on the other side of the River Thames that uh, I took the picture through the window. And, um, and I still use it in my presentations. I should probably update that picture at some point. And the fifth and final thing I think you should avoid is using what I call small images, this kind of thing. So people put a little image, a, a, an image on their slide with white space, or in this case, blue space, all around the image and the title above it. Why not do something like this, where you fill the slide with your image, you put some creative text with, a, with this has got a, like a, a shadow or a glow around the outside, which you can do in PowerPoint, and you put it over the top, and it just looks so much better and so much more creative and classy. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the five things to avoid then, just to summarize, are cliches, clip art, low resolution images, copyright theft, and small images. So if those are the five things to avoid, what should you be aiming for when using images on slides? Well, the first thing is I think you should make the images impactful. They have an impact on your audience make them colourful. Nothing wrong with using uh, monochrome images, but if you're using colour, then um, it makes them stand out more, makes them more memorable. Also make your images quirky. This image is quite quirky, I guess. Make them different. In other words, not cliched is what I mean by that. If you can use something that, that is humorous, amusing, that may also help to get your message across. You may be thinking this image on the screen here is, is quite, quite amusing, unless you suffer from uh, chorophobia or the fear of clowns, in which case you're probably wanting me to move on fairly quickly. So my final point is, most importantly, that the image should be relevant. And again, think about rice. Uh, is, does it reinforce, illustrate, clarify, or explain the point that you're trying to get across? Can, that can apply to images as well as slides in general. So make sure that the image is relevant. Let's cover a couple of um, image usage examples now. 
Here's a typical kind of bullet point slide, isn't it? You've probably seen these all the time. Five bullet points talking about the five features of a camera and a fairly pointless picture of the camera at bottom right. And you know what's going to happen, don't you? The speaker is going to start reading those points. It contains a large bright display that can easily be seen in full sunlight. And the problem is, of course, when the speaker's on bullet point number two, you're reading ahead to bullet point number five. You're getting cognitively exhausted because you're trying to read at the same time as listen, and it just doesn't work, doesn't get the message across. So let me show you how this could be presented better. The first point on here is about the large bright display. So my slide says large bright display, three simple words, the minimum words you could have on that slide to get across the point that you're talking about the large bright display and a really good picture illustrating that large bright display and then i as the presenter can now talk about the large bright display i can tell you all about it i can tell you what the size is what the brightness is whatever technical information you need to know about the large bright display on this fantastic new camera and then each bullet point has its a separate slide with minimal words on it and a large picture or in the case of the ergonomic design three pictures to give an idea of the the ergon ergonomics of the design and we go through that way through the whole set of slides. And this is the way that Steve Jobs used to present when launching a new Apple product and the way that they still do it. Here's another example, exactly the same sort of thing. Five bullet points, the speaker is going to read the bullet points, the audience is gonna get exhausted and bored. And what I've done with this one, it's, it's simpler. I've got a picture of the lavender on the left-hand side, up comes the title, and then five bars appear. So you can kind of tell already that there's gonna be five points. But again, it's minimal text. The first bit says, eliminate nerves. So I can now talk around the around how um, eliminate nerves, <clears throat> how, sorry, how lavender helps you to eliminate nerves. And then I can go through the rest of the points and talk around those. So the slides are congruent with me as the speaker. And the final bit about images, I'm going to show you some image usage techniques. I'm going to talk about four different techniques. <clears throat> the first one is panning. The second one is masking. The third one is it's more of a concept than a technique called the rule of thirds. And the fourth one is cutouts. So panning, if you've got an image that is long horizontally or vertically, then it might be quite a good idea to pan the image on the slide. This is my website and obviously a website slide a website image if you like is in its entirety is quite a long uh, vertical image so i've panned down more up my website so you can see the whole thing uh, this is another example where i've got the sky in the background panning from left to right whilst the balloon morphs from top left to bottom right and the panning by the way can this can all be done in powerpoint this what i'm showing you here today is a powerpoint presentation everything i've done here is done in powerpoint um, so you can pan, you can pan by using the morph tech, morph, the morph transition, which is a really brilliant transition. If you don't know how to use it, as soon as you get off this, uh, the, this meeting tonight, play about with morph in PowerPoint, it's fab. Um, or it can be done using what I know is custom motion paths in, um, in PowerPoint. Masking. This is a good technique if you want to pick out a part of the slide. So this is the middle triptych of Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earth Delights, Earthly Delights another free to use creative commons image and you'll see that under that disc on the painting there the detail of the painting on the right hand side is a face or a head and this is a self-portrait of bosch that he snuck under the disc in his painting so okay so what i've done there is i have focused in on a small part a small detail of a complex image and this is very easy to do what i've done on this is drawn a rectangle over the big image on the right hand side drawn a circle over where the head is, and then I've punched the circle through the rectangle to make a hole in the rectangle to, to create this new shape. Again, that can be done in PowerPoint. Then I've given the whole new shape a translucent background, so the painting still shows through, and then I faded it in over the top of the painting. So this sort of technique can be useful to, as I say, pick out something, a detail of an otherwise complex image or complex screen grab maybe, but masking, yeah, masking technique can be, can be a very useful technique to use in your presentations. The rule of thirds was first posited by John Thomas Smith in 1789, and he suggests that by dividing an image into thirds, both horizontally and vertically, and then placing the elements of that image along those thirds, it gives the image more edge, more interest. And I kind of agree with that. 
But one great byproduct of the rule of thirds in PowerPoint is that it gives you a handy space for a title. So here we see the, the, the beach uh, the shore on the bottom third of the image, the bird on the right hand third of the image, and a nice space top left there for the title of the slide. And the final image technique I want to cover is the cutout. So here we have a nice, you know, a nice title slide, a uh, picture of the ballet dancer. But if we cut out the ballet dancer and place her toes on the bottom of the slide, it just looks a lot more, a lot more classy, doesn't it? And again, there are some rudimentary tools in PowerPoint for cutting out images. This image was cut out in PowerPoint. So as long as you've got a, a decent enough contrast between the foreground and the background, the cutting out tools in PowerPoint work quite well. But of course, you can do this kind of thing in any image editing program. Here's another example. This guy looks quite uh, menacing, doesn't he? But if we cut his head out and move it off to the left of the slide, then suddenly he looks a lot more threatening, don't you think? And don't forget also, um, cutting out the balloon image you saw earlier on was obviously a cut out image. If I just left the balloon on its background, it would you'd have seen a floating box going up the slide, which would have looked really silly. So to make it photorealistic, I'll cut the balloon out and put it on the sky background um, and, and brought it in that way. So my final point, ladies and gents, is the, the, the main bout of the afternoon, slides versus handouts. This is the point where I say, if you take nothing or only one thing away from my presentation, let it be this. So first of all, here is a, a really awful slide. I hope you'll agree with that. It's a slide that I use in my workshops in a little exercise, which is called, what is wrong with this slide? Um, and we have a little competition between two sides of the room to try and find the 17 things that are wrong with this slide. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through those today. I'm just showing you this as um, as an example. Um, and it's about the marketing funnel, the five stages of the marketing funnel. And it's got all the text on again, so it might work quite well as a, as a handout. And so this is my point. This is one of my biggest mantras, and it's this. If your slides work as handouts, then they don't work as slides. Okay. Now, you may have heard slides referred to as speaker support slides. And I want to get you away from that way of thinking and think of them instead as audience support slides. Your slides are there to support the audience, to support your message, yes, but your message getting across to the audience just for the time that you are standing on stage, whether it's five minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, your slides are there to do a job to support getting your message across to the audience. And there's a handy acronym to remember audience support slides. And just in case you've got the wrong image in your head, here's an image that will help you to remember audience support slides. So let's go back to our really bad slide. As I said, it's got all of the ingredients for a good handout, but it doesn't make a good slide. To get across the five points of the marketing funnel, this is how I would suggest it's presented when you're presenting on stage or online. So I want to talk to you today about the marketing funnel, the five stages to loyal and engaged customers. The first stage is awareness, where your customer becomes aware of you via your marketing and advertising. The second stage is consideration, where your customer thinks about buying your product or service based on seeing more of your marketing and advertising. And then comes the all important third stage, conversion, where your customer actually spends money with you and buys your product or service. But that's not the end of the process because after that you want to engender loyalty in your customers, get them to come back and spend more money with your company. And finally, we hit the holy grail of the marketing funnel, which is advocacy, where your customer goes out and shouts about you and your company and your products and services to their friends and family. And in turn, their friends and family become your customers and spend money with you. So those are the five steps to loyal and engage customers of the marketing funnel. So I hope you'll agree that was a lot better than the original slide that I showed you. But here's the point. If I now stood up on stage, as many speakers do, and said to you, don't worry, I've made all of my slides available as a handout, which you can have after my presentation. Well, we have a problem because, first of all, there are seven slides in this new presentation. Second of all, I've cut out all of the text so that I can be congruent with my slides and I can speak around my slides. 
And thirdly, of course, if you try printing those out on paper, you're going to use up your blue ink toner very, very quickly indeed. So what do you need to do? Well, you could just give out that handout, couldn't you? The, the black on black text on a white background. But of course, I'm sure you'll all agree with me, the design of that was pretty awful. So let's redesign it. So here's an example of a handout that you could produce to give to your audience. It's got the same funnel, the same colors, the same typeface, the same pictures of the guy, but down the right hand side. But now it contains all of the information that I, that I talked about in the presentation. And the customer could take, your audience sorry, can take that away and read that at their leisure and understand what you were talking about. Now, most people say at this stage, doesn't that mean more work? And the answer to that, unfortunately, is yes, it does. But don't forget, your slides and your handouts are two different channels of communication and need to do the job for which they're set up to do. So make sure that your slides work as handouts. I'm going to repeat it one more time, ladies and gentlemen. If your slides work as handouts, then they don't work as slides. So I am going to scroll through the chat, uh, first of all, to see whether there are any questions that anyone has on chat. Um, Elizabeth has said, I have a green screen and I use MacBook Pro and I still get shimmering when I change my virtual background. What advice can you offer to fix this? Um, okay, so virtual background presenting. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a second so you can hopefully see me. I'm going to move you guys back on to even though I can't see, even though you've all got your videos turned off and I can't see your lovely faces. So um, there are three things, I think. There are three elements to using virtual backgrounds when you're presenting. Uh, ah, hello, Val. Oh, well, Philip's turned up as well. <laughs> so there are three elements to using virtual backgrounds. The first thing is to make sure that you are lit, that your face is lit um, and that um, you can be seen and you can be lifted off the background behind you. Um, the second thing is to make sure that you use a green screen. It can be green or it can be blue. The reason green and blue are used, by the way, is because they don't they, they are complementary colours to our skin tone. Um, if you use a red background, then you're going to get the background showing up on your face as well, which would look a bit weird. Um, so if you've got a good quality green background, um, but the third thing is, and it's the most difficult thing to obtain, is you do need a fairly robust PC to play or to use virtual backgrounds, you'll see that you can use video. I mean, the background I've got at the moment is a video background. You can see the colors subtly changing through the through, through the rainbow. And so you can use video backgrounds as well as stills. But if your computer isn't high enough quality, then Zoom won't let you use video. So, so light your face, use a green screen, and make sure you've got a robust PC would be, would be my advice. Um, Helen says, what would be the basic cost to set up green set up screen light microphone etc and two screens okay so they're going through those one thing at a time to, to set up the screen the the green screen um I, so i did it with a roller blind now you can get these pop-up green screens um all over the place and i don't think they're particularly expensive obviously make sure you've got one that will fill your screen you, i've often seen it where people have got a green screen which is kind of half the screen and you can still see their kitchen or their lounge behind on the on the left and right hand edge so then that's not expensive as I said before, the ring light that I've got here, I think cost me £19.99, really inexpensive and does the job really well. The microphone is quite expensive. It's, I think it's about, about £149. So that was quite an expensive piece of kit. But it, it, it's for me, although the quality of the microphone in my webcam isn't bad, for me, having good quality sounding voice is something that's really important when you're a speaker. And the second screen, well, second screens aren't that expensive. I don't know exactly how much they are. You can get a, a fairly decent second screen fairly inexpensively. Um, and then there's plenty of links online to show you how to set it up. It's, very, it's normally it's fairly plug and play, to be quite honest. Um, so it's, it's quite a simple thing to do. So, yeah, so lights, web, the webcam I use, I think, was about £90 on Logitech. Um, and, and that's it. So it's not it's, it's not the cheapest thing in the world to do. But if you are serious about online presenting, and I think we need to be now because I think this isn't going to go away even after we're all back in the room again, then it's worth making the investment in, in my humble opinion. Um, are there any more questions in the... Uh, Serena asked me, why is it better to use two screens when presenting slides? Well, so, uh, okay, so I did explain this in the presentation. Literally, from my point of view, is because I put my 
The screen that I'm sharing is the one on the left hand side, so I can keep the slideshow off on the left hand side and I can put my presenter view on the middle screen. And as I say, I have three screens. I put my audience on the right hand screen. Normally that you're now you're now back on this screen again, so I can see you well, see see a few of you anyway. Um so that's the reason I do it. You don't have to do it, but it just I think it just makes life a bit easier having having two screens when presenting um with slides. Um those are all the questions from the chat. If anyone else wants to ask me a question um then please feel free to probably best thing to do is to raise your you can raise your hand in the um in the participants box i think that's where you can do it isn't it i believe in the participants but no it's um down in i forget where it is now just just turn off your turn on your video and raise your hand physically and if, if you've got any questions i will i will attempt to answer them <laughs> elizabeth hi um, hi, thanks for answering my question about the no problem. Um, green screen and so on. No problem at <laughs> um, all. I think the computer is okay. It's a MacBook Pro, so it really is um, a Rolls Royce, but it's not delivering. I can't get the background. However, my second question to you is this. Um, bullet points. Are you suggesting we avoid those at all cost, or we should just use maybe one or two with an appropriate image? Okay, one of my, 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 second, my second mantra after the slides and handouts thing mm. is, is aimed towards zero bullet points. So, you know, sometimes it can't be avoided, but don't, I mean, the, the problem with PowerPoint is brilliant. It can do so much stuff, but the problem with PowerPoint is that it, it is that it leads you into bad habits because you go into the template and it says, it says add a title slide. That's fine. Add a title slide. Then you say, add a new slide and it says, right, put a title and some text. That's what you've got to do next. That's the best way to present title and text. And everyone thinks, yeah, great. So I'll just type in loads of text. So what I do is when I start a PowerPoint presentation, I go into the slide masters, I delete all of the slide masters and everything on them. So I'm starting with a blank canvas. And I often don't even start on PowerPoint, I start with a pen um, or a pencil and a bit of paper. Um, so, and when I run my workshops, we have a little, we don't go near a computer until the afternoon session. Um, in the morning, we do a little, a little ex exercise with colored pencils, which is great fun because it gets you thinking visually rather than thinking about writing out reams of text or lines of text. So yes, yeah, so I would say aim towards zero bullet points. Think if there's a better, think about if there's a better way you can get your message across rather than using text. And there normally is, by the way, there normally is a better way of getting your message across. And, and as I say, think about even whether you need to be using slides in the first place. Does that help, Elizabeth? Great. Um, can I ask oh, a question? Of course see, you can, yeah. Yeah, I see uh, your round light is reflecting in your glasses. Have you a solution? Yeah, it's, it, okay, if I'm looking up, yeah, which I'm doing now, actually you must be, I must, I must admit, I probably should be sitting up higher in my chair. Normally it's fine. Um, maybe I'm a bit slouched today. It's been, it's been a busy week, Rob. You see, I'm just slouched in my chair. That's what it is. So I think maybe if I'm looking up, you can see the light. So the solution for me is to keep the lights above me rather than in front of me. And if I'm looking into the camera, I should probably be sitting more upright. So I should probably be just, just adjusting my camera slightly so that you, so now you can't really see the lights. A little, there's a little bit of light showing. Um, I should, maybe I should put my light above my monitor just slightly higher. But if you keep the lights high, um, and, and also what I probably should do is to have the lights both at 45 degrees rather than one at the moment, one's in front of me, one's at 45 degrees. If you've got them both at 45 degrees, then the light will probably reflect off rather than going straight back into the camera. Okay, thank you. No problem at all. Do we have um, any more questions from anyone before I just move on to the very, very final bit? I, I had a question. Martin, hi. Uh, just uh, I came in just after you started. Uh, could you just go through the rice mnemonic because I didn't quite catch. Okay, I'll do it very. I'll do it very quickly for you because everyone else obviously heard it. It stands yeah. for reinforce, illustrate, clarify, and explain. So my point was that if you've got a point in your presentation that needs to be reinforced or illustrated or clarified or explained by the use of a visual or a graphic, then it's a good candidate for using a slide. Otherwise, if you don't have a if you're making a point that doesn't need to be reinforced or illustrated or clarified or explained by the use of visual then don't be afraid to not use slides for that particular part of your presentation so because most people what a lot of people do is they just think um either they they don't use slides at all which is fine no problem 
or when they say they do use slides, they use slides for the whole presentation. They don't ever think about, let's switch the slides off for part of the presentation because I don't need them for that part because I'm telling a story about my about myself, for example. Don't need slides to be on the screen for that particular part. So that's really what Rice is all about. Hey, David, do I have a question, if that's okay? Hi, Justin. Hi, how are you doing? First of all, excellent, excellent presentation. Really, really enjoyed it. Uh, learned a lot. Um, is there any guidelines in terms of background color and the color of the font for corporate settings? Um, I know that obviously you would use, you know, each company may have its, you know, its own set of corporate colors, but in, in, in an event that that's not available, do, do you have a suggested sort of color um, recommendation? No, the main thing is the, the main thing is to make sure there's enough contrast between the foreground and the background. Um, don't forget, if you've got people in the audience who are partially sighted um, or have have trouble seeing, then then um, you need to make sure that the, they they can they can read because of the contrast on your slides. There are actually some guidelines on the, I think it's the Royal National Institute for the Blind website. There used to be that tells you whether a color com combination you're using would actually work for, for blind people. But I think really um, making sure you've got the good contrast between the background and the foreground colors. Is the most important thing um talking about corporate templates most corporate templates are really really boring because they've been designed by the it department and not by the communications or marketing <laughs> department uh, so unfortunately <laughs> i really feel sorry for the people that have to use them unfortunately they they, they are and again they, the templates are created to to um to have a, a set of bullet points and so people naturally present really really bad presentations and we're all sitting there thinking oh my god i don't want to be in the room at the moment please let me go or we start staring at our phones or looking out the window or falling asleep um anyway i digress yes no i think from the point of view of colors contrast is the is the important thing um so yeah a lot of people you will use black and white i find that a bit boring but certainly make sure that that what's on your slides can be seen and, and read easily simple as that Okay, Dave, from the point of view of colours, can you imagine my background is red? Can I imagine it's red? Okay, yeah, I can imagine it's red, go on. <laughs> so, can you conclude? Can I, con can I conclude? Oh, I see, sorry, I was, I was miles away there. Of course I can conclude, Evelyn, yes. Um, thank you, let me just share my screen again very quickly. Um, that was very subtle. By the way, um, Evelyn, thank you. <laughs> so we've gone from the Q and A. So really, all I wanted to say is, um, if anyone wants to keep in contact with me or make contact with me or wants the PDF files that I was mentioning earlier on, please send an email to Dave at the slide presentation man uk, or connect with me on LinkedIn or go on to my Facebook page. And I just want to say once again, uh, thank you to Evelyn for organising uh, or for arranging with me to speak to you guys today. I hope you found it useful. Um, enjoy.